Okay. Uh, so this is lecture eight of uh, ECE 503. So in this lecture, um, what we're going to be talking about is, uh, just like what we talked about last lecture, uh, this idea of the discrete time version of what we saw in lecture seven. So it's going to be deja vu all over again. Oh, Yogi Berra. So a um, little bit different mathematics. Um, yet it yields some very interesting tools that we're going to be using later on, uh, definitely in this course. So, first of all, um, we need to know a few things that are going to be different compared to the continuous time version that we just saw. So the first thing that we want to pay attention to is the fact that um, the discrete time signal does not have a period t of p, or t at all. It's going to be n. So, first of all, capital N, and that's if it's a periodic waveform. And just as before, um, if it ha it's a periodic um, waveform, like a, a discrete time periodic waveform, uh, then the frequency components are going to be separated by 2 pi divided by N radians, rather than hertz, right? And then, unlike the continuous time signals and their spectra, go from minus infinity to infinity, what you're going to find is that the discrete time signals will be uniquely characterized only across 2 pi. So every 2 pi, boop, it's a copy. Boop, it's a copy. Boop, it's a copy. All right. So this is actually really powerful stuff, because suppose you have a discrete time periodic waveform. So what would that be? So suppose you have a sign that's coming in, and then you have a uniform sampler. Boop, 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 boop. It is sampling at some rate, and it's being collected by some sort of embedded processor. So what you have is essentially a series of little stems, right? Samples that follow the envelope of a sign, but they're actually all, uh, they're, they're discrete time, and they're periodic, right? So here's one period. Here's another period, here's another period of, um, of that signal. And so what we want to do is we want to characterize it. What is its CK? And the answer is it doesn't have a CK. Okay? Instead, not, not in the way that we thought of it, right? Instead of going from minus infinity to infinity or even across uh, TP, what ends up happening is we, let's first of all assume that this x of n is also related by harmonic, uh, is related through harmonically related uh, exponential functions. So just as before where we had harmonically re related complex exponentials with some sort of weighing, we do the same here with x of n. But the difference is the following. So first of all, um, we have instead of that tp or that f naught, we have n. And so, therefore, 2 pi k, little n divided by big N, and here's our coefficient, our complex coefficient that weighs each one of those sinusoidal contributions that form x of n. Let's, let's pull a little trick, okay? And this is what's going to differentiate this guy from the other guy, from the continuous time version of a periodic waveform. And so if we do that, let's, let's, let the first trick is, let's do the following. And I'm totally allowed to do this, okay? Nothing says I can't do this, so let's do it. So the, what I, let's say here, what we do is the following. We take all the ends, the little ends on both sides, and we sum both the left-hand side and right-hand side. We sum them up from 0 to n minus 1 across the period and as well as multiplied by e to the minus j 2 pi ln divided by n. Totally allowed. What I'm going to do, so what I just did is multiply left-hand side and right-hand side by e to the minus j 2 pi l little n divided by n, and then sum both sides n ranging from 0 to n minus 1. Totally allowed. I can do that. They're equivalent. I'm going to stop being annoying. OK. So if I do that, then let's look at the right-hand side more, more closely. 
right hand side, um, what we see is something very interesting coming up. So let's merge complex exponentials. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, that, that e to the minus j 2 pi ln divided by n, and I'm going to bring it inside the summation, multiply with the other summation. I'm still allowed to do that. I'm going to merge the two together. And so what I get is one exponential term, and in the exponent, I'm going to have k minus l. Interesting proper property, that k minus l. What happens if k minus l is not equal to zero? Well, first of all, what happens when k minus l is equal to zero? We get a 1. Hey, we get a 1. Right? What happens if it's anything else? What ends up happening is, ultimately, if I take the summation of all those guys, all permutations of L, all those permutations of K, from 0 to N minus 1, they all cancel out. Zing! What ends up happening is that all of those terms, with the exception of when K and L are equal, cancel each other out. If there's, a, if there's um, one value that is positive, there will be for sure another value that's going to be negative. Remember, the complex exponential consists of sines and cosines. So they are periodic. So at some point, it's going to meet its opposite. Just like from the old Star Trek, right? There's this guy from this world, and then there's this other guy who's antimatter, and they fight and they duke it out, right? Like they, they have like the the only way you can tell them apart is one guy has like white paint on one side and black paint on another, and the other guy has uh, just the exact opposite color scheme, and you can't tell who's antimatter and who's matter. And this is the exact same case. They're like fighting in space, but only one guy comes out non-zero, which is the case when k is equal to l. There are n of them, which means that at the end, that summation is equal to n. Right? And therefore, what turns out is when we have that situation, we, we reduce it now down to one summation. We only reduce it down to one summation. And so it turns out that we get this magical expression. What we get is c, c of l is equal to 1 over n, the period. So we're normalizing by the period again. Um, the summation from 0 to n minus 1. That's the period, again, of x of n, and then this e to the minus j 2 pi ln divided by n. L goes from 0 to n minus 1. So this is our analysis equation. So if I want to find out what the frequency contribution is at the lth frequency for x of n, this is how we solve for it, right? This is our analysis equation. So, okay, so I'm using this term analysis and synthesis. So what, 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 what's analysis? Like, hmm, let's analyze this. No. Uh, what happens is analysis equation means that we're analyzing. It means we're decomposing. We're bringing it down to its roots, right? Its individual frequency con contributions. Synthesis is, oh, I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to create, I'm going to synthesize, I'm going to bring together to form this, this guy, this, the, the, this signal, this x of n. Um, and analyzes, I'm going to break it down into its fundamental frequency terms. Right? So that's, that's what frequency, and uh, I mean, analysis and synthesis is. And then um, the synthesis equation, speaking of synthesis equation, is this guy here. And so there's a name for this, and I actually used it on the board, the DTFS, or discrete time Fourier series representation. And we have a shorthand for it. So this is where, this is one of the places where people get kind of confused. So, um, so if it's capital F, it is continuous time, it is continuous time frequency. If it's capital omega, it is continuous time radians per second, right? But if it's little omega, it is discrete time radians per second. It's the it's discrete time frequency term, and little and little f as well. So so there's this nomenclature, and a lot of people kind of like 
Uh, when, like, you know, so, and, and it's sloppy. Some people say, well, they put big F, and that's frequency. But to me, big F means it's a continuous time signal, right? Or a big omega. Little omega, to me, always signifies a discrete time frequency, a discrete time signal and involved, right? Here, uh, what is omega k equal to? Omega k is equal to 2 pi k divided by n. And this is going to come up later because when we draw the frequency contributions, we're going to use omega k. And omega k will be defined from minus pi to pi. So what does the PSD, or uh, here is power density spectrum. Um, other places call it the power spectral density. Same thing, PSD, PDS, um, either way. What happens is, ah, uh, third time tonight, Parseval's relationship. So in this case, um, same thing as before. If we take the magnitude squared of the signal and then sum it across its period um, and then normalize it by the length of its period, or if we take the sum of the magnitude squared of the coefficients, those so c of k's, those c of l's, and sum them from 0 to n minus 1, gives you the exact same thing. It gives you the power, right? Because energy will be infinite because it's periodic. All right? Now, delving deeper. What we've got is we have Fourier transforms of a discrete time aperiodic signal. And again, um, not to go too much into uh, to the details, um, but the way you would express it is essentially your synthesis equation and your analysis equation. So remember, so what happens is if you want the frequency contributions of a time, discrete time domain aperiodic signal, uh, x of n, what you would do is you would take x of n, multiply it by um, e to the minus j omega t, right? It's not w, it's omega. And then you would sum it across all n. Remember that in this case, I'm not going to sort of belabor the derivation, but remember when we did the aperiodic representation, we basically took the limits of a periodic signal, one copy of a periodic signal, and sent it to infinity. Much the same way here, but we're not, like, you know, I didn't go through that motivation, but it's essentially the same thing. And you can see it in terms of the analysis expression. We're assuming, as opposed to a periodic waveform, that we're going from minus infinity, n equals minus infinity, to n to plus infinity. So we're looking at all frequency contributions, and we're assuming that x of n, again, um, like uh, outside of a, a certain range, out of a certain set of values, is going to be 0 at those extremes. And then the synthesis equation, again, the exact same thing as before, but we take the integral across its fr uh, the frequency contributions of, uh, across 2 pi and, um, and then e to the j omega n and normalize it by the period uh, 2 pi in order to give us uh, x of n. Um, and then the energy spectrum, here is Parseval's relationship again. And the power spectral density, or, en uh, or energy spectral density, magnitude squared of the frequency response, uh, the, the frequency x omega. So, okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of rushing through this. And the reason is I want to sort of go a little bit more into detail about how we can use the discrete time Fourier transform, the dt, ft. And this is how we use it. So here's an example. So, so for instance, um, how do we analyze? So this is a very, very simple ex um, um, example. Um, and we can actually work it out. But um, so, yeah. Let's go to PowerPoint. OK. Let's go to blank. Boop. Blank. <laughs> ah, good. Pen. Okay. So suppose we have something like this. So we have um, x of n is equal to a of n u of n. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to find out what its power spectral density is, right? Or or energy spectral density. But the, in order to get that, the first thing I need to do is I need to take the Fourier transform. 
Okay? So whenever you see squiggly F here, uh, you know, fancy, fancy F, what, it, what that means is I want to find what its Fourier transform is. So I'm told that this, first of all, this guy here, first of all, it's discrete time. It's a discrete time signal. And it's also aperiodic. Therefore, I need to take the Fourier transform so in order to get x of omega. So in order to do that, what I need to do is what? I need to sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity and take whatever x of n is e to the j omega n. I forgot, is it minus or plus? <laughs> it's a test. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, discard. <laughs> I wasn't sure what they mean by annotations. And survey says it is minus. Penalty for everyone because no one answered that question. No, just kidding. So, um, going back. So what happens is we have... <laughs> Let me try again. Third time's the trick. Ah, see, that time I saved it, but I didn't want to save it. X of omega summation from n equals minus infinity to infinity. X of n e to the minus j omega n, right? So that's our Fourier discrete time Fourier transform. Okay, so now what we know is that that guy is going to be equal to a n u n e to the minus j omega n. Okay, so far so good. Now, this guy here, that's really cool. He's going to affect our lower limit of n equals minus infinity. It's all going to be zero until n equals zero. So, as a result, n is going to be equal to zero to plus infinity a n e to the minus j omega n. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is the following. Huh? No, no, no. Well, 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 kind of. Like, I'm going to group them together, right? Mm, yep, exactly. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to group these guys together. e to the minus j omega to the power of n, right? So now what I want to do is I'm going to try and use a geometric series on this guy. So what I'm going to do is, through the property of geometric series, I need to make sure. So make sure that this guy here, this argument, make sure that he is less than 1. Correct? So, and so how do you do that? So let's take, we take the magnitude of e to the minus j omega, and he has to be less than 1. Well, we know that this t term here, uh, this phase, th this essentially, uh, when you take the norm of that, that's actually doesn't matter. That actually, th that complex term uh, disappears. And all we're left with, so as long as we guarantee, if we're told, like, so we're going to make an assumption, assume, then we're good. We're kosher, right? So, Given that, by geometric series, what it turns out is that that guy, uh, scribble, 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 is going to be equal to what? 1 over, right? What? 1 minus a. Yep. And uh, anything else? e to the minus j omega, right? Perfect. Thank you. So, so now we have this. Great. The next step is, let's get rid of the anode. So we're not keeping this this time. Ha, ha, ha. Now, we know that he's equal to that. e to the minus j omega. What we want to do now is we want to find, find the energy density spectra, density spectra, or spectrum. 
for singular. So in order to do that, what do we know? So E, S, the energy spectrum, um, in this case, uh, over omega, is going to be equal to the magnitude squared. What is that equal to? Com complex conjugate. So when you see that guy, that's my conjugate. Right? And so when I do that, what do we have? So um, we have 1 minus A e to the minus j omega. And then what's the complex conjugate of that? 1 minus, and we, we can make the assumption that A is real, e to the j omega. So now, what, so denominator and denominator. So when we multiply this out together, what do we have? So we have 1 and 1. We have um, A e minus j omega, A e plus j omega. And then when these two guys multiply together, all we're left with is A squared. This guy here is cosine, 2 cosine, 2 cosine omega. So at the end of the day, my energy spectrum is 1 minus 2 cosine omega plus A squared. Oh, A. <laughs> Sorry about that. So that's, that, and that's just a very simple example um, of like one way. And, and, and in general, what a lot of folks, when we use uh, Fourier transforms and Fourier series is really to the, see the frequency dimension of a signal, right? There's a lot of information that might be missing um, in the time domain. You can't see it in the time domain, but in the frequency domain, it's quite apparent. Like, for instance, in the open-ended problem that is in your problem set three um, with phonemes, you know, in speech, when, when I do, uh, you might say, okay, in the, in the time domain, um, it might look like one, one type of signal or whatever, but in the frequency domain, it speaks volumes in terms of uh, where the energy is located at the different frequencies. And it's very unique, uh, as opposed to ooh. And in fact, what's kind of interesting is uh, because human speech also varies in time. So it's like, how are you? The energy of your speech signals is actually located a few very clearly defined frequency bins called formants, right? And those formants are telltale signs of what is being spoken. I remember I took a speech communications course when I was a graduate student, and what we had is like we had this like five second speech of like, you know, the, the yellow dog jumped over the lazy fox, or actually, I think it's the other way around. I don't know. But what happened is we weren't told that. All we were given were, here's the formants, figure it out, right? And you learned everything about phonemes and, and, and the like. Everything from like, you know, uh, fricatives and uh, um, nasals and everything. Nasals are kind of interesting because like on the phone, if you say M or N, sounds the same, right? Because a phone, traditional landline phones, cut off frequencies above 4 kilohertz, right? And that's exactly where you differentiate between N and M is uh, that above 4 kilohertz part. You will see all the energy closer towards the 8 kilohertz part. Of it. And just a little bit of a difference. You can tell if it's N or M, right? <sighs> anyways, just a, like a digression. So anyways. So that's, so going back to, uh, to the slides. So that's what we see over here um, in terms of... Um, um, uh, sort of the outcome. So this actually is really important for us if we're trying to understand where exactly all the, free, uh, the energy is located at what frequencies for that signal. And so um, that's actually pretty important for things like what I mentioned, like a speech communications person would need to know where the energy is located in order to say that's that phoneme, that's that phoneme, that's that phoneme. Now, um, in lectures 5 and 6, we talked about Z transforms. 
And now we're looking at Fourier transforms. And there is actually a connection between the two, right? We're not going to talk about, uh, there are a variety of other transforms, but for the most part, um, Z transforms and Fourier transforms are used a lot in digital signal processing. But folks might say, okay, well, so what? Um, where, like, you know, why do we need to know, know both? Like, what's, how are the two related? And the answer is whether you want to play on the unit circle or not. So, for instance, um, if we actually go through, like, you know, let, let's, let's take this back. Let's go back to this guy. So remember what the Z transform was, right? So X of Z is equal to that, right? X of N, Z to the minus N, right? So that's our Z transform. And then remember here, this guy, Almost the same. <gasps> is there a conspiracy? Almost. What happens is, so this is our Z, funny Z. Here's our F, funny F. And so Z transform and Fourier transform domains. So how do we bridge these two guys together? And the answer is the following. Uh, what we can do is... Let's see, like, remember that Z is, can be anything. Z, so recall that Z can be anything. Ooh, okay, exciting. So let Z equal R E to the what? J omega. J omega. It could be minus 2, right? It doesn't really matter. It should not? OK. So, <laughs> so, and we saw what happened, right? When we, we set it up this way, what we've got is we have the Z plane. And everything is about radi like, you know, there's uh, radial distances and there's azimuth, right? So we have the unit circle, right? We have, like, locations of poles. We have zeros, right? And then we talked about whether it's causal or not causal, stable or not stable. Um, and then from here, so let's say we have something that looks like this. And then it's like, oh, OK, uh, my region of convergence is going to be here, right? So it's not causal. So, so we saw that. Let's bring this guy to this side here. So suppose we want to make that connection. What do we do? Well, let's replace Z, OK, that Z transform thing. Now let's replace him with z is equal to r e to the plus j omega in this expression, right? So if we if we do that, ex oh sorry, eh. I don't want to erase it for fear of losing everything. So if we do that. We have x of n. We also have r e to the minus, uh, minus j omega n. Is that right? Oh, and then also r here, because we're plugging it in, right? So it's also going to be minus n, this guy here. Correct? So the thing is, I want to equate the two together. And the only way to do that, to achieve that, is that we're operating on r is equal to 1. Where basically, when we do, uh, when we're playing with the Fourier transform, we're essentially, in order to have that equal to the z transform, 
is basically we're in the z domain, but we're operating solely on the unit circle, right? So in order for, so the only way to bridge these two worlds is when r is equal to 1. The radius goes out to 1, and we're only playing on the unit circle. Now, the, the problem is, uh, you know, first of all, we have to, um, you know, whatever our region of convergence, whatever, what, wherever we're playing, that, so not only we're we playing on a unit circle, we better be in that region of convergence. The only concern, okay, um, is suppose we have a pole, a pole on the unit circle. Then we're kind of like messed up. Then we can't do anything, right? Because it's our Fourier transform is going to explode. So that, that is an issue that we need to sort of pay attention to. But otherwise, yeah, like, you know, this is how we kind of bridge the Z-transform domain and the Fourier transform domain. All right. Okay. Now, uh, there is actually a kind of a cool trick, and this is sort of an aside. Your book kind of talks about it, and I thought, why the heck? Like, you know, I should share it. And it's something called a Kepstrom, right? So what happens is, suppose we have something called a complex Kepstrom of a sequence x of n. So how do you find a Kepstrom? You essentially take the natural logarithm of the frequency representation of x of n, and that will give you a Kepstrom. And what you'll find is that should converge in the region of convergence on the, on the left-hand side. And if you go through the math, if you go through the math, right, and all, all this stuff, and, you know, we work through all of it, what you end up getting is, like, you know, so, so, you know, there's all this complicated stuff, and you can look at it on your own and such. And I, you might say, well, why did Professor include this? Well, it actually has a very, very nice property. And what is that property? So Kepstrom, what you do is you can use it to separate two convolved signals from each other. So this is actually powerful stuff. So um, there's a lot of folks out there that play with uh, homomorphic deconvolution, or just called deconvolution. What happens is if you have two signals, let's say x of y, and they're um, convolved together, th you can use Kepstrom, these complex Kepstroms, in order to sort of decompose. You can pull apart those two convolved signals from each other. So the math that we saw in the previous couple of slides kind of shows the logic of how you can get uh, those kept terms in both the magnitude and the phase representations, right? Um, but for the most part, um, you know, the, uh, you know, we're not going to be using kept terms all that much. But if you're in some field that you know you require to sort of deconvolve um, two signals from each other, this is a very powerful tool. So it's more like FYI. So yep. Oh no, no, no. Uh, oh, for which one? Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about it. You could have used it, but um, if you if you can if you can understand how how it works, right? Because the thing is, this just describes like what I just put up here is like this is what kepsims are, but the analysis that goes along with it could be rather complicated to d sort of do the, do the deconvolution. But yeah, for the most part, you can you can use this in order to deconvolve like two signals from each other. Yep, great. That thanks for bringing it up. I completely forgot about it. The last, last slide, so this is kind of, you know, kind of like, you know, I, uh, everyone in this class actually comes from a, a variety of different backgrounds, right? So there's biomed and uh, robotics students in this class. There's mechanical and, and aerospace engineering. There's civil engineering. There's a lot of electrical engineering students. Um, and, from, and from different areas as well. Um, you might say, well, why, why do we care about frequency analysis in general? And it's because, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, different areas play with different frequencies, and this is a very, very powerful tool. So, like, some of the values that I list here are kind of like frequencies where people play in with respect to, um, you know, w whatever their discipline is. So if you deal in biomedical, like, you know, electrocardiograms or uh, electroencephalograms and stuff, so e ECGs and EEGs, so, like, you know, signals that basically go through your nervous system or in your heart, um, you're playing in frequencies that range from 0 to 100 hertz. Maybe I'm mistaken, but for the most part, uh, that, that's where a lot of the interesting stuff happens. Um, 
speech communication folks, if you're studying speech, you're interested in the first 400, uh, sorry, 4 kilohertz of, of frequency. You know, so speech signals usually range from 100 all the way to 4. 8 is actually preferable. Before, if you're playing with landline phones and you're filtering out the signal, it's usually 4. 8 would be desirable. But it, on the other hand, if you play with audio, we're talking like 40s or 50 kilohertz um, to get like, you know, all, all the audio frequency like music and the like. Seismic noise, um, really low frequency, right? Because these signals are very long, you know, like earthquakes and such. FM radio, um, so we're talking about 80 megahertz to about 100 megahertz. Um, Wi-Fi, the stuff that we use now, assuming that you use the 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz band, so you would be looking at frequencies there. Um, there's other ISM bands like 900 megahertz, which is great. Infrared is even higher, so infrared light and such. Um, there are people who use infrared, like even like you know uh, key fobs and the like. Uh, visible light, we're now talking like terahertz and such, and then ultraviolet, which is even beyond that. So each one of these frequency ranges, different disciplines have like sort of different interests in. For instance, like visible light communication and ultra infrared and ultraviolet, I have friends of mine who are at uh, Boston University, and they're looking at like visible light communications. So let's suppose that your headlights has information you want to pass to the car ahead of you. What would happen is essentially uh, your, your lights would modulate some frequency, uh, some information on top of the visible light that would communicate to some receptor in the back of the other car and say, oh, by the way, I'm about to crash into you. Ah, you know, which probably happened in the last few days with all this snow, right? But, but for the most part, each discipline has different frequencies that they play in. Uh, in fact, wireless communication folks, which is my area of expertise, um, we usually play in everything from hundreds of kilohertz all the way to about 100 uh, gigahertz and such. So um, if you go higher, now you're going to the light territory, and, and for the most part. Fiber optics folks, on the other hand, like, uh, who play with lasers and such, or visible light communications, they, they play in like terahertz and such. So very different, they're a very different beast. And then um, the more natural speech and audio processing, even like a, a bioelectric type of signaling, we're talking like, you know, very low frequencies for the most part. Okay? So every, so every discipline has sort of like um, an area that they, that, uh, you know, uh, is a frequency range. But the tools that you're learning here can be transcribed to each one of them. What, what brings these all, all these guys together? So thinking practically, what's interesting about all of these guys is most folks don't play with this in the, in the um, how can I put it, in the continuous time domain. They're all digitized, right? Like, you know, for instance, Professor Clancy, who plays with, like, a lot of that bioelectric signal processing stuff, um, you know, what he does is he dumps everything in the MATLAB. And MATLAB, last time I checked, does not do anything in the continuous time. You've got to digitize it, right? And then he does the analysis in the, in the discrete time domain. My wireless comms, I, even though I can, you know, futz around and play with FM radios and stuff, for the most part, everything is digitized. All my signals are digitized. I play with digital comms day in, day out. And so for the most part, again, going back to the motivation of lecture one, uh, more and more, a lot of the processing that we're playing here is all digital for the most part. There, there are some exceptions. Like for instance, um, in like fiber optic communications, um, there's a thing called the OEO. So optical to electric to, to optical communications. And so that was kind of a pain in the butt for a lot of fiber optic companies uh, like Nortel when it was around and Cisco and such. Because what you got to do is you get this laser, it's going down the fiber or whatever, light's going through the fiber, and then it's got to be, I guess in Boston speak, would be wicked fast. You would have something basically in an incredible analog digital converter, you have an incredible amount of digital logic that would be processing all of that. Let's say you're filtering out some light, and then you would have to convert it back into a laser and or a light and send it back down the fiber, right? And then a few companies, like Nortel had this, um, the big thing, uh, if they can get away with it, is something called OOO, optical to optical to optical. And that is one of those spaces where, uh, for the most part, you can play in, in the analog domain. If you can play all, in all optical, you don't have to worry about the expensive, um, you know, 
high speed analog digital digital analog conversion and the pr processing power instead you just keep it all in the optical domain and it just it in the end it's 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 a lot nicer you don't have some of the impairments that you would have in the electrical domain anyways so i digress but nevertheless uh, this just kind of goes to show that we live in, in a in a world rich in frequencies and and to analyze them and such so uh, with that uh, that concludes uh, lecture um, lecture eight okay so what we're going to do is we're going to just take a five minute break again so just to stretch your legs so